Hello and welcome to my Beyond History series where we will attempt missions in Kerbal Space Program's career mode that no real life space program has yet accomplished. We will do so with the Realism Overhaul set of mods and Real Solar System, so we are based on Earth at Cape Canaveral and will be launching to Mars, Jupiter and so on. This series is a direct continuation of my previous Realism Overhaul series, which primarily covered the early development of the space program through the moon landing and through Voyager-like probes. All of that continues to have its mark in this save, including the station you see here in orbit around Earth, tentatively named Spaceport 2. Actually, uh, this portion right here is actually Spaceport 1. And uh, so we just docked Spaceport 1 to Spaceport 2. Uh, we have also built up a fine war chest of funds, as you can see there, 18 million. Uh, we have plenty of science, and we have a solid reputation. In this video, I want to describe the current situation of the space program, our active missions, and what we intend to do from here, which is mainly going to be focused in the short term on colonizing the Moon and Mars. But we need to talk about our extra missions. Here we have Kazu Kerman and Alan Kerman on Spaceport 2, and uh, this is actually the vessel that brings our Kerbals up and down. This is the Orpheus 2, and it's basically an Apollo Command module on a service module here with uh, five engines they are the ast no sorry four engines they are the asterisk two engines which are hypergolic engines they burn uh, erazine and n204 and i guess that's an important point here one of the mods in realism overhaul is real fuels and so if you're used to kerbal space program the way it normally is with liquid fuel and oxidizer we have far more fuels, and that's why you can see that the resource panel is much more complicated. So there are a lot of fuels going on here. We've got liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen for the fuel cells. We've got Arizona and N204 is mainly for the RCS thrusters and all the engines here, though MMH can sometimes play a part on the RCS thrusters on certain portions, especially Spaceport 1 you saw there, where uh, I hadn't decided on Arizona yet. And, of course, ablator is normal, a lithium hydroxide is just used for the CO2 scrubber, and we are using TAC life support, so we have food, water, and oxygen, and uh, that eventually gets turned into carbon dioxide waste and wastewater. It doesn't make any, uh, cause any problem if you are full up on carbon dioxide waste and wastewater, uh, even though, of course, famously Apollo 13 had a carbon dioxide problem, and, uh, but in here, we don't have to worry about that. They do not die from a carbon dioxide buildup. It's just assumed that it is evacuated into space once the tank is full. All right, so that's the basic idea. And let's take a look at some of our other assets already in space. Here we are in the tracking station. And for now, I have retained remote tech. So we do have communication lines. So I am in the process of reconsidering that to streamline things. For now, remote tech is still here. And so that's how we manage communication. Uh, we have here a fairer number of missions, but I actually cleared up most of the legacy missions that were hanging out, you know, stuff that had been launched, fulfilled their missions, and were just uh, sort of derelict in space uh, in order to make sure that uh, this save, you know, functions properly for the long run. We do want all that cleared up. So we went from like 100 uh, existing missions to just 35, which is still a lot. Uh, we have a probe landed on Mars, as you, as you can see. These are all providing communication support right now around Mars. And then uh, this is a probe landed on Deimos. It's just a tiny little lander, uh, nothing to write home about. But I guess, in a way, we've already done things that real space programs have not done. No space program has landed a probe on Deimos yet. But we're intending to do some more extreme stuff, especially with crewed missions. Uh, really, in the previous Realism Overall series, I did a whole lot of stuff with probes. And we really pioneered many things with probes, but we didn't, we weren't as outgoing with crewed missions. This time, I want to focus on sending Kerbals to places, and that's a little bit trickier, so it's a good thing that we have a lot of funds. We have uh, one mission orbiting Jupiter. Don't worry, we'll, on the more important ones, I will uh, jump to them. But this one is orbiting Jupiter and may be uh, altered. Its orbit may be altered to try and hit a moon or two. Uh, Tugmaster 5000 is orbiting the moon just in case we need a tug. Uh, 
Uh, Jupiter Orbiter 2 is currently orbiting the Sun and is actually not a Jupiter Orbiter. Uh, it was redirected to Uranus. So it is intending to have that Uranus encounter in 13 years. So long ways off. Uh, we're not going to bother about that. One reason we're going to be focusing on Moon and Mars missions is because they have a shorter time of fulfillment. A lot of this stuff that's going to be uh, probe-based will be on its way throughout a large chunk of the series, so you don't really have to worry about it. We visited Spaceport 2 already. We had a probe that landed on Phobos, just like the one that landed on Deimos. And uh, oddly enough, uh, we sent another Phobos probe to Venus instead. And uh, so it is currently orbiting Venus, uh, just in case we need some extra Venus science. And uh, this is actually our geosynchronous satellite around Earth, just one for now. Um, here we have a Titan shot orbiting Saturn, and uh, it is scheduled to have a maneuver uh, in a little while. And that maneuver will get an encounter with Dion here, one of the moons of Saturn. And so that maneuver is scheduled in 44 days, it looks like, down here. Uh, here we have an AGS mission orbiting Jupiter, and it is intending to encounter Io in 41 days. So we will get some signs like that. We have a probe landed on Ganymede, another thing that uh, had never been, has never been done. So, again, ahead of the game as far as probes are concerned. Okay, and then uh, this is a probe that is going to encounter Jupiter in 27 days, and we will have it make orbit in 100 days. This is a Moonport resupply mission that actually went awry. Well, no, I, I think uh, it might be the probe. No, no, that's just uh, been tossed out. That one we could probably get rid of. But uh, then we get into the missions that uh, we launched much more recently. Uh, this is a mini probe landed at the moon. It can actually still do seismic readings. Uh, this is another Ganymede lander, just like that one. But this time we are not going for Ganymede. We are going to attempt to land it at a different moon of Jupiter. And we'll make a maneuver to start that out in 46 days. And uh, we'll probably be landing maybe on Europa. And that'll be after that maneuver there, maybe a week or so. So you can look forward to that. This is another probe orbiting Venus. So we have some communication support around Venus. And this is just going to be providing communication support around Jupiter. This was the leftover probe from the previous Ganymede lander. It carried the comms. Well, some of the comms. Uh, this is the first of our Voyager missions. This is the Ambassador, that's what I call them. And you can see it's already aimed at Jupiter and Saturn. Let's take a look at it, because we have a few of these. And I'll show you what those look like. But they'll be long term, you're not going to get to see them again for like, years and years. Uh, so, enjoy it while you can. Of course they've got the RTGs, because out there you can't have solar panels, they're not going to work and we have contracts to fulfill. Now, you might be wondering what version of KSP am I running? And this is actually Kerbal Space Program 1.1.3. 1 uh, since this uh, all started, we have gone through 1.2.2 and now Kerbal Space Program is in 1.3.1. Oop, a little beep there. Let us see the state of our probe. I always worry about turning to the probes because every now and again they just randomly blow up when I look at them. But this one should not have that problem. We, we, it's been more recent. It's only just left Earth, basically. Okay, so this is our probe. And this is an ambassador mission. The other ambassador missions look just like it. It's got a little orbital telescope. It's got four RTGs in total. And it's got four goo containers in total. It's got a magnetometer boom. So these are from D-Magic Orbital Science. And I told it to toggle, but it would take three minutes to actually extend because right now we have signal delay thanks to remote tech. Uh, that might not be uh, continuing in the series. It depends if, uh, if we experience too much lag. We've got other instruments as well thermometer, barometer, all the usual ones as well on top here. So, well, micrometeorite detector. And uh, this is a surveyor core. 
And so it has a lot of delta V. It's got 3,222. And that's presumably including... No, I don't think that is including the fuel in the surveyor core because that's just an RCS thruster. So the fuel in the surveyor core is only going to be RCS. All right. So that is a mission that we have headed out to Jupiter, Saturn, and beyond. Uh, we have a lot of contracts for that sort of thing. If you take a look at our contracts, we've got one for science data from space around Titan from the surface of Titan. Uh, we're going to have an interesting time getting that. Uh, Neptune flyby, Pluto flyby, Pluto flyby, and uh, we'll talk about this position uh, satellite in a stationary orbit of Jupiter. That's a tough one because it's close to Jupiter. Uncrewed Europa landing, we know we've already got a Ganymede lander aimed for that. Uncrewed Titan landing, and Uranus flyby. So those are our contracts. and. The Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto flyby are all being done by these ambassador probes. So this one is headed out and it, we see a Saturn periapsis and it'll try and hit Uranus and Neptune after that. But we'll turn back to the tracking station. Now I was talking about the versions of KSP and why I'm not using one of the more advanced versions. Well first of all, Realism Overhaul is not configured for 1.3 yet. And so the highest version you can use Realism Overhaul with is 1.2.2. I tried to upgrade this save to 1.2.2. That didn't work. Um, it, it was looking all right for a bit, but then uh, some of the orbits of some of the missions were off. That was fine. Uh, the, that could be fixed with a minor burn kind of thing. But then one of the missions was totally off. Another of the missions exploded when I got there to check up on it. And that was rough because that was actually a moon-based mission. Uh, actually, sorry, a Mars-based mission. We'll take a look at that in a sec. But you get the picture. Um, our contracts were all gone uh, because apparently Contract Configurator was reconfigured in 1.2.2. And so, yeah, enough had changed that I was a little bit worried about trying to upgrade so that is the situation. Maybe if we didn't have so many missions that were still hanging out, it would be a little bit better. But we do have all these missions. Okay, so one ambassador mission hitting Jupiter, Saturn, and beyond. Another ambassador mission is going straight from uh, Jupiter to Pluto. It needs to do one burn right here. Right now it's going from Jupiter to Saturn, but we don't want that really. It is aimed uh, to hit Pluto in 12 years. So it's basically our New Horizons mission. And so we're hoping that that will fill that particular contract. And then the final ambassador mission right now is a focus on hitting Uranus and possibly Neptune after that. So that is that mission. Just in case that can't hit Neptune, we have this Exo Moon Explorer. Right now it doesn't seem to be uh, doing too much. But, that, and that's interesting actually, we might need to fix that. It's supposed to be headed out to Neptune, and if you take a look at this maneuver, uh, this one in 25 years was supposed to be at Neptune, that's why that maneuver is there, to uh, get into orbit around Neptune, but it doesn't seem to be doing that, so we'll take a look at that in a sec. MAPSAT-1 is uh, encountering Jupiter. It's going to try and get into orbit around one of Jupiter's moons and scan it. It's got a uh, mapping uh, radar. It's uh, from ScanSat. Uh, Titan shot is around... Uh, well, I think that one has failed, actually. Because otherwise it wouldn't be orbiting Earth, would it? Callisto MAPSAT. Now, this is interesting. So actually, even in this version, the Callisto mapsat isn't hitting Jupiter. I believe we left it hitting Jupiter, but it has decided to give up on that whole plan. Interesting. So it isn't just 1.2.2. Uh, it seems like this problem was a problem here. Well, here it is. This was supposed to be our little Callisto mission. But instead of hitting Callisto, the maneuver that it was supposed to have in Jupiter SOI, I can tell it was a dummy maneuver 
that was supposed to indicate we had uh, reached a point where we needed to do something, but it's not where it's supposed to be. It was supposed to be in Jupiter SOI. So let's get rid of that, and I suppose we can see if it can hit Jupiter if we do another burn like this. You can sort of see it's uh, trying to... Okay, there's, there's a pseudo encounter, but it's not a good situation really. Yeah, this is definitely not going to make it into orbit around Callisto the way it's supposed to. And that node is going to be in 11 years. But let's just uh, take that glitch as what it is and clear that off our docket and add. So you can see we've got a lot of stuff to do. But don't worry, this is not what we're going to be focusing on in this series. I spent a lot of time in the previous series on probes. And this I'll make short work of as far as this series continuing. But yeah, it will be done in one way or another. Okay, so beyond that, this is a Mars sample return mission, also something that's never been done. Uh, so we have an encounter with Mars, it's going to attempt to land on Mars and bring a sample back to Earth. Uh, that sounds like an ambitious mission, right? Well, that's why we have another one. <laughs> we have we have this one coming in earlier in 222 days and this one over here coming 100 days after that. So we'll definitely find out whether this one worked before that one comes in. You can see the Pluto ambassador in between them. This is another map sat for uh, which got sat uh, well we might have it hang out at Jupiter, we might move it on to Saturn to try and map Titan, we'll see. I'll decide on that. Here's another Mars sample return mission. And so, well, uh, that's actually in between the other two. So we'll have a few shots at that. We might land one of them on Phobos instead and get a sample of Phobos or Deimos. If it turns out that either the entire mission setup is flawed in some way, or we already did the Mars ones so we can use them on, on the moons instead. Exo Moon Explorer I already discussed and we want to take a look at that. Let's take a look and see. It really needs to be moved on to Neptune. It was supposed to go to Triton, Neptune's moon. Right now it doesn't seem to be headed there, so let's fix that. The reason we have so many missions to the outer planets right now is because Looking at the current in-game date for Realism Overhaul, it's October 22nd, 1977, just after the Voyager window. And in real life, NASA launched two missions to the outer planets in the Voyager window. That's Voyager 1 and Voyager 2. We, however, launched a whole lot of missions out to the outer planets in this window. Some of them did not work out so well, but others are the ones you see like this one. And uh, this one was supposed to head for Neptune, but we seem to need a little tweak. And I'll show you, I guess, uh, episode one is as good a time as any to talk about how to tweak your orbits. The reason the Voyager window is special is because it lines up the planets in such a way that Jupiter is going to give a boost to get to the other planets. And um, actually, this is a good time to talk about how to eyeball such a thing. You can see Jupiter here is behind Saturn, which is behind Uranus, which is behind Neptune. Well, it says Triton there, but that's the moon and Neptune. And so what's happening is, when Jupiter comes over here, we reach it, and we use it to get a slingshot to Saturn, which will have come, you know, around over here by that time. And then we use that to get a slingshot to Uranus, and then further on to Neptune. Uh, if Saturn was behind Jupiter, you couldn't do that. So if Jupiter is here and then Saturn is here, not a good time to launch if you want to go from Jupiter to Saturn. Same thing with uh, Uranus and Neptune. You want them just a little bit ahead. And in fact, this configuration is basically, famously, the ideal situation. And we also saw that uh, going if you go straight from Jupiter to Pluto, you can make this one. Uh, you swing by Jupiter and it slingshots you to Pluto. But right now we want to reconfigure this approach to Jupiter so that slingshots us to Neptune. So let's fix this. And let's unset uh, Triton as a target because 
that is ultimately our target, but we would ra much rather want to focus on Neptune first to make sure we get that encounter. And the trick here is that every little thing you do close to Jupiter has an outsized effect because Jupiter is big and has a lot of a lot of gravity to work with. Right now we're out here, too far away from Jupiter to get the benefit that we want. So I'm not going to wait until this maneuver here. Well, yeah, um, I don't even know why that maneuver is there. That maneuver probably shouldn't be there. I'm gonna just say that right now. We've got a Jupiter encounter and I want to go back to my craft. Oh, let's get rid of this maneuver too. Let's replan everything and encounter. So that was what we were really aiming for right there. And we can uh, just go faster and eventually we should be able to close that gap a bit. So the first thing is to adjust prograde and then I just let's keep those numbers up and that does not well problem is they're definitely changing ah okay if I move away from MacJab we see the change alright ah there we go so there we have a Neptune encounter but there's a catch when you use Jupiter for an assist like this be absolutely sure you're not crashing into Jupiter <laughs> so here we have a crash course at Jupiter this is not going to work very well for us so we're going to need a little bit of a standoff distance. There we have a periapsis, but that means we lose our Neptune encounter, I believe. Uh, indeed. So we're going to have another adjustment to make. I'm not satisfied with this 20-year approach. That's a long time. So let's see if we can nudge that back a bit. Uh, okay, so this will be later, right? The closer we are to Neptune right now, the sooner it'll be. Okay, that gets us earlier, but I bet that's a crash course. But if we go faster, that's 18 years. We may need to move the... See, our descending node and ascending node are ways away from where Neptune is. We might have to sort of nudge them over to where we're actually encountering Neptune. It looks like 18 years is the best we can do, but again, it produces a crash course here, so let's just nudge it one meter per second difference. One meter per second is all it takes to avoid a crash at uh, Jupiter, but also that same one meter per second takes away our nice little encounter with Neptune. On the right side, uh, just because we're not encountering Neptune right now doesn't mean it's a big problem. All it means is that we're going to have to adjust our orbit after we pass Jupiter in order to make that encounter happen. So if uh, it will let me, yes it seems like it'll let me make a maneuver node here. We can uh, further adjust oh, quite a lot actually. And thus we have a Neptune encounter, well 20 years it looks like. And we're going very fast, you can see. We're hitting Neptune like that. This is our orbit, so we're actually encountering it very quickly. Our specific desire is to hit Triton and try to get into orbit around Triton. Even land on Triton. But perhaps for now, this is the best we can do. We'll have to plan ahead later on. So, we have that maneuver. We add that maneuver to Kerbal Alarm Clock, and we will revisit this Exomoon Explorer at that time. So there it is. Let's move on to the tech tree, and so I'll show you where we're at as far as that's concerned. Okay, so here is our tech tree. I don't know why Kerbal Alarm Clock doesn't go away, but anyway, uh, here it is. Uh, where we're basically at and what led to this series being started, this new wave of our, our space colonization, is the unlocking of nuclear propulsion. 
Obviously, nu nuclear propulsion is not something that has actually been used in space programs, but we are about to embark on using the NERVA and solid core nuclear engines and all sorts of fancy stuff like that. We have a lot of additional futuristic mods in here to make uh, things more interesting. Uh, for instance, all the way out here, and perhaps our furthest goal is to unlock warp drives, and this is from the KSP Interstellar pack, and well, I'm going to have to tweak them a little bit as far as, you can see they say non-RP0. RP0 is the career mode for Realism Overhaul, and right now it's not supported by RP0, but it is my goal to figure out the balance, you know, based on, you know, what budget I have by the time we get there, how much should it cost, you know, what what is reasonable for when we actually get those parts. But that's a long way off. We do not have that kind of science yet, but we're aiming to get that. Uh, there's all sorts of other technology. We have USI colonization parts. Uh, that, that wasn't one of them. That was actually one from KSP Interstellar as well. And uh, we'll have to work through a lot of this stuff. I'm trying to find the KSP I mean, uh, the USI colonization parts. They allow us to build bases. Oh, well, that's some of them. A UKS nuclear fuel processor and mobile refinery. Aside from the nuclear engines, our most advanced engines are uh, generally the NK engines from uh, Russia, NK-33, NK-43. We haven't unlocked the RD-170 yet. Um, we do not have the RS-25, which is the space shuttle engine. Our most advanced Hydrolox engines are the J2, and uh, we haven't actually purchased, uh, we haven't done the entry cost on the M1 here. We have the F1 from the Saturn V, and we have the RL10s, the Centaur engines. And uh, yeah, that is where we're at. Uh, I mean, some of those engines, like the RL10, still being used today. And still, some engines in use today that we haven't unlocked yet including like the Merlin engines for SpaceX. So we're, we're sort of at the cusp of some advanced technology, but some technology we do not have that real space programs do have. But eventually we're going to get some really fancy stuff, and that's what we're working towards. In this series, the timing of our missions is partly due to transfer windows, and for that we have Transfer Window Planner to help us, let's say we wanted to go to Mercury, figure out when is the optimal time to do that. But another consideration is Kerbal Construction Time. It takes time to build our rockets, and here you can see Moon Base 1 being constructed, and our Nerva Tug. So you can tell what's coming up here. We are intending to land a base on the moon, and we have a tug to do uh, future missions, uh, primarily to the moon first. And that tug will be reused, it'll be on a sort of cycling pattern, it'll boost stuff up to the moon, and then it'll bring itself back down to lower forward again to pick up another payload to boost to the moon. That's really the only way to use the Nerva effectively. It has 60 ignitions, we do have limited ignitions, and so we're going to use all 60 of those ignitions, and reuse it and refuel it in order to bring payloads to the moon. Now Moonbase 1 is going to get a crew that is currently on our moon port. So this is going to be constructed in 13 days and I've deliberately avoided turning to our moon port because well it is uh, going to be the, the sort of base of operations for some of the stuff that you're going to see in the next few episodes. So let's turn to that now. Okay, here we are at Moonport 1, and it's it's really actually very small. It's actually just this portion right here. It has two of these crew cabins, and otherwise some fuel supplies, and, and uh, food, water, and oxygen supplies, and that's it. This is a refueler vessel, well, resupply vessel with food, water, and oxygen, as well as fuel here. And so is this. Uh, this on this side here is was our first little uh, reusable lunar lander. It's not very good, it's not safe at all, but Valentina did take it to the surface and return to orbit with it and redock here. So it was successful, 
but not particularly safe. The two vessels on the ends, of course, are versions of our Orpheus spacecraft that uh, are docked here, and they brought the crews that are currently inhabiting this. And I say crews because there are two crews inhabiting this. There are a total of six occupants, and so two groups of three. And currently we have about 90 days of food, water, and oxygen here. Okay, 87. And meanwhile, on Spaceport 2, around the Earth, we have quite a lot. We have uh, almost two years. But uh, here we are not intending to keep six crew on this station the whole time. We want to land some crew on the surface, potentially at that, mar uh, at that moon base that we are building. So that is something that's coming up. But we do have to do that quickly, right? Uh, not only do we have to land that moon base, we also have to send over a lander to pick up uh, three of these guys and also land them there. Either that or we could resupply this with more supplies. We could just dock it to the end here, actually. And um, yeah, we could just uh, continue to supply them as they wait to reach the surface. But uh, that is coming up. Incidentally, uh, this station around the moon has been continuously occupied for a fairly long period of time. So as far as making sure that we supply them, we've been doing that very diligently, as we've been doing for the station around the Earth, though so that's easier, of course. But we have the craft, and we have the rockets to do that, and we will continue to develop those. But anyway, with this being our prospect, not only developing a lunar colony, but also developing one on Mars hopefully soon, I'll say thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did enjoy this video, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.